Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you again for coming on behalf of the U.S. Department of State. Thank you all for coming out. I do want to send a shout out also to the Minnesota Department of Human Activity, Sean, for putting this together with relatively short notice. If you don't know where all this works, they get an email from someone back at home office in D.C. They do want to host Larry, who's Larry, from he's from Nigeria. Okay, that sounds good to me. Let's make it happen. Within about two or three weeks, this one came together. Dr. Kurt also stepped in from the Hunter Institute, so thank you very much for hosting here as well. And so here we are, and we can begin this informal presentation after two quick comments. One, I'm not an expert in Nigeria. I spent about 26 months with them, and I know quite a bit about it because I lived there and worked there and met a lot of folks there, but no one knew an expert. I can give you some of the details, I'm running out of time. But for the really deep and dirty bits of information, I might have to dig a little deeper. Number two, many of the opinions that I say today are mine. They're not up the U.S. government, they're not up the United States. So please keep that in mind too. If I don't have enough time, you won't know the difference. But the reality is, these are my personal opinions. So I think with that, we can maybe get into some of the formal presentations. So, how many folks have been in January 2016 in the global last time? I know there is some info. Okay. Yes, Ken. So, January 2016. I gave a presentation on a similar thing. I was on the ground about seven months at the time. And when we were working through this, we were talking with Ken, you really want me to talk about it. I've been on the ground for months. And his response to me was, well, that's seven months more than everybody else. So that gives me this expertise in terms of talking to them. Okay. So one thing I did last time, which I thought worked pretty well, is when I say the way my jury will come to mind, and so maybe we'll start there. So just give us all the ways we can do this thing. All right, I'm okay, good one. We're one of the most populous countries, so I'm going to have a degree as well. Spoke more than one, okay, that's always a good thing out there too. We will just try significant amounts of that for sure. I think the last one, we'll talk about some of that as well today. Some of the secessionist movements are going to Yeah. And we're going to move into you. I mean, obviously, there's are sitting there. Just before I left, they found 46 million U.S. dollars in the apartment, about three blocks from my apartment. 46 million U.S. dollars. The way after you have to just answer the email. But you got it, so I'm part of the family that I have to accept. So, what's interesting about that response is the last time I did this, when the world was broken, by the way, three weeks in, okay? So, that is actually a lot of the perception that Boko Haram is still kept a little less so than it was before, even just 18 months ago. So, we're going to talk about some of those issues. But I've done a lot of correction, which I did last time, okay? Also, an endemic issue in Nigeria, but not on top of mind here as well. Oil was number one, I think, and certainly that's an issue, especially because they don't go over the job of the energy and the energy and the energy and the issues as well. Yeah, but I'm going to ask you other words to it. And I did this last time, and I think it makes sense to do it again. Imagine 35,000 Nigerians on a diesel line, which is the size of Target 2, and just every day, over and over again, doing that kind of thing. And they're going to use this as well, about 4 or 5,000 dollars for new families to reunite with my dreams. But that's just some of the folks that we um, talk to you in terms of environmental issues, and all of my trafficking issues, and political issues, and economic issues, and all issues. So all of those issues are there. So entrepreneurship is a big one. That is very much vital and important in the dream. Entrepreneurship, innovation. The Facebook team, and the led by the Zuckerberg Foundation, has a um, technology hub that they're building on the United States in Lagos, which is actually from the Council of Action, where they go and try to find the best of the best among Nigerians. No education required to pass the test, and they're running a thousand pass the test. That's how many people take the test, because you know, here they've got over 150 fellows. But this and their foundation, among other things, are really driving the force of technology in Nigeria to come to the development. It's an active on the discussion. That's what they do. And they send folks out to San Francisco and other places to learn some of those American business skills in addition to their technology skills. So entrepreneurship is going Now, we see that on the industrial level. We also see it on a day-to-day level. Outside, hackers are selling peanuts by the 
stick them in your fingers like this and walk down the street with them as your second chapter. Yeah, it's entrepreneurship too. And there's a really competing um, issues around that. Down the road, I can tell you down the road, all the way from up the streets. And the argument then, of course, is well, if you let the community continue down the road, then the talk continues, people get hurt, you see people get run over, and that's how you put it. The alternative is if you clear it all then what do they do? What do they do? Where do they go? Do they decide to fall into the local around issues, terrorism issues, all of that? So it's a complicated sort of situation. We want to fight this for what they're going to. So the, the religious aspect of it is important. But like most places, what you hear about are the extremists, not necessarily the folks who live in the day to day as people like religious Christians, religious Muslims, and paganism. Is, is animism is also out there too. I'll tell you a story about an animist and some things that are out there. It's a real animism. Right? The man is street fictions, people who can turn into goats and animals and things like that too. So that is a real thing there. We have to respect that as Americans, as American diplomats, as that is the entity we want to go up in. So the other suspects of it too are very important. So I think that is what it's this one. In addition to the words that we talked about before. So I'm going to go ahead and forward this. What do we do in the State Department? There's a fly outside that talks about this. Part of the whole country in that program is free to come out and tell you that we exist out there, by the way. There are about 8,000 foreign service officers, maybe double that in terms of specialists and, and the folks who do a lot of the work from the service as well. And then we have about maybe 25 or 30,000 civil service, mainly based in Washington, but also scattered around the country. And we also have a local and locally engaged staff, obviously. And those are the folks that are locally hired generally to help support and stand on the seas and missions in the world, too. But what do we do? We do three trade American jobs, and I don't have to read this, we can, we can get the fire at some. But it's very important for everyone to realize that American democracy is part of what we do overseas. And these are some elements that we do. If you ever travel to Nigeria, I encourage you to do so, but if you do, then you register first. And we can help you out there in case anything strange happens. About 300 missions around the world. This is a map. Kind of fuzzy, you can't really tell. A lot of the black dots are where you are in the world. Um, if you divide 3,000 by 300 or so, you get about 25 or so. So they got 25 foreign service officers per mission around the world, which is really not a lot. When you think about it, and when you think about it too, there's a running joke within the State Department that basically says there are more military band members than our foreign service officers. This is true. Okay? I'm not just banding the idea or the band, I'm just saying the fact that's out there that there are very few of us compared to the DOD and something as well. So we all scatter all around the world, anywhere from Iraq and Afghanistan and down to Lagos, which is coastal highways. One of my best friends I met in Lagos is in Buenos Aires now, and other other things I've read, Brandon, Milan, all the nice places. They're all the very nice and nice places, too. And places you might think sound nice on paper, and not that nice, and you know, it's like Fiji, so it's good, right? So it's not a very nice place. It's a very good dictatorship these days. It's a very, 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 that is very important in terms of its location in the Pacific as well as a lot of the issues that we do economically in the region. So, speaking directly to the U.S. Embassy in Nigeria, this is right after that page thread. This is a new, uh, new ambassador, Ambassador Simonton. He just arrived a few months ago, and I've had the pleasure to meet him and travel with him quite a bit. And these are after his folks that deal with the HIV issues that are out there too. Nigeria is one of the largest recipients of PEPFA. This is a, a presidential um, declaration based that gives the money for these and HIV research and combat. Okay. So they're signing an agreement here by promise of half a billion dollars. And this is some of the things that the U.S. government does in Nigeria, not just in Nigeria, but also in the world. I think a lot of folks have seen a similar type of map here. From left to right, we've got the map of Nigeria, which is in the middle. And a rock over here, and this is where it's located in Africa. And this is probably the most famous map and the the fun that's ever put in this place in the world. This is how big is Africa. Right? When you look at a map, you're going to need to have some rotator projections and the stretching of the world and some of the latitudes. Stuff looks really big about that up in Africa because it's roughly on the crater, which is really small. And you can see you can fit China and United States, all of India, all of most of Western Europe, maybe UK and other countries within. The country of Africa. Don't make that mistake. It's not a country. 
and people go ask for fun and where do they speak for what language do they speak? That's it's a very usual kind of sort of question you would get. It's a part of my job too when I come home to some educate folks in South Africa who's as big it is and then Nigeria is, which is about twice the same as from the and Jews about twice the same as from the And roughly from Lagos Valley was up to Lake Sapphire again, it's about this distance, about 800 miles, about 70 years ago, it's from the Golden Border. You can figure that back by two. That's a part of this, too. And right in the middle, you have a Bosnian, which is a relatively new uh, type of much like Washington, you see the land of the sun, and then that's where we're at. Um, look, we have the embassy in the Bosnian, and I live down in Lagos. Down here, on this side, I'll actually go into it. So, you know, put them down. And this is um, languages, and we're going to go. Okay, hang on. So, we talk about Nigeria itself in terms of what it is and what it's not. Nigeria is a group of people who are from the Dinka, after World War I, basically, when they drew the boundaries and they came over some and said, Britain, here's what you have. And because we defeated a group, of course, with the Germans and the Italians, the Germans are covering the country. And that was given to French for the Cameroon of the sea, and that's where you get the Cameroon from. But this is a, a map of the language you've ever spoken. These are the major the Aruba on this side, on the southwestern side, and the Ibo is sort of over here. This is actually Cameroon. Ibo over here is a completely different language. And roughly, if you drew a line right in the middle to the north, that's the house of them, which is mostly the Muslim of them, the house of the Lions. But you can easily see it in the middle. There are at least a couple dozen languages just on this chart. The reality is there's over 500 languages in Nigeria. 500 different languages in Nigeria. There are over 200 different independent cultures. And one of the strongest differences between the Igbo and the Yoruba is that the Igbo don't recognize kings, for example. So in the Yoruba land, you have a king, you have a chief, you have a king, and it goes up from there. There's a guy called the King of Kings, the only Igbo. And he is elected by the other kings, and he becomes the representative of the United States. And he actually visited Washington, D.C. with his entourage. I do the king of the sports visas. They set fire to the capital and the steps of it, and they have a citation, or they set fire to the citation because of it. So, you know, they, they, they want to come over and show how uh, <laughs> so some of the traditional countries, and they want to bring them to the federal police. So, just like that. But the, the good news is they all came back. And the, the, the threat is that. They become part of the centralized and they come back. And so that's where they come back most. And then they do come back. And many of these things are the king of kings that are out there. But now they have no kings at all. So they look upon each other and they're a little bit of a side on them because they don't want to hear them. And then you've got the Muslims on the top and the Greeks that are here. The house, so you can see the broad spot that they left them. And fewer people, much fewer people, but nevertheless, some of the major group. That's a point. And I wonder where they were when I was there. So I can, I can say a few words. I could give my um, previous adjudications to the Urban, what we call Mama Urban. So you know, where are you going? And then what do you do? And then you visit. It came in very, very handy. And I remember being at a market where they were showing this blanket that had butterflies on it. So it so, was so, 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 a very I don't want butterflies. And the woman dropped the <laughs> material, shocking me. And I call all the market people in to look at me. And they say, What did you just say? So I said, If you're really not Christian, that's, that's how it happened. You were there. It's too strong. So you talk about just a few phrases. That actually means a lot. But I don't know what I'm going to do. Here are some of the ethnic groups that there are too. It's a little different from one of them. It's the ethnic groups. So in the southwest, we have again, as you were going to the states, you can kind of see them in terms of it's a little difficult to see the Koyo, Urban, Urban, Kwara, Kogu, and then you've got the middle region, so the middle belt, sort of up here, and then down here, the other, and this is usually the Igbo folks in this area, and then you've got the Hussifal, Hussifal, and the folks on the side. I think it's worth talking about how this came to be. Again, after World War I, when the Germans were defeated and Germans were defeated, the French and the English sat down and said, Okay, maybe you can have Nigeria, I'll take Canada and the sea, and I'll take Togo from the Germans, so I'm now French. Then we went to the French, then I went to the English, and then everyone went to South Africa, so essentially the UK at the time. So all these countries were carved up without any real consideration of who actually lived there. And think about that. 
So back in Universal, when they drew up this map, they didn't really care who was there. They cared more about the resources that they knew were there. They knew that there might be potential for rubber. They knew there might be potential for coal and some sort of land. At the time, they didn't have oil there, so they might have been coming up later. But this is what happened. And since then, really, they said, you know how to get along. You play this game, and you know how to get along. And they don't really want to get along. They've never really gotten along. They were so different what we really think and what they think about that they really don't want to go along. Although, I should say that many of them really do, for the better of my dream. They know that secession is, secession is not a reality, although they try. They would be off the war in 1967, 1970. So we have about 10 million people, mostly through starvation and naval blockades. And the guys who went back on the pro Nigeria side had to get put in back home and maybe become president of Nigeria. So you can see that the Southeastern folks, the evil folks, really felt like since then, especially, they have had very little to no representation in the government and what they want to do. When oil was done, so that came to the home of them and the worms in. So, talking about the Alpha a little bit, this is the full country. And then over here on the upper right is the map of the Alpha at the time. So, this is what had claimed to be the Alpha. Nobody was going to be the capital of the Alpha, the Alpha is sick. And then you come down here and come down. Port Harcourt is a major oil place that's up in now. And those are the states that um, are down in the Delta region. These are the major Delta regions down here. So, they overlap pretty well. Between what's here, roughly this line is roughly here. These are the major upper folks, and this is what all the oil is. So the Ebay and the South say, well, how about all these resources? Why do we just care? I don't want to share these resources. It's not that it's not out there. It's not like, okay, well, let's see how this works. And then they didn't feel they're getting a fair share of whatever is happening, both within the government and economically. And the government traditionally, because Abuja is relatively close geographically to, to the north, a lot of the folks that run the NPC, which is the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, are also from the north, 679, which is a gross misrepresentation. There's no oil north of this region. There's no oil up there. And yet, the folks running that quote unquote non profit organization, from the north. So they are the ones dictating terms to the folks who have the oil and they set up a map. So there is enough of the northern area where they are looking at secession once again. Something between secession and reorganization, redistricting, what is the term for it? Destruction, thank you. And what about oil in Nigeria? My wife, thank you. She was in a political section in Nigeria for about an eight months or so, and this was her region. So she mentions the law. If anyone has any real questions on about this, please do really want to call the details. I'll give you the, the one to version of the so, and so that's basically what happens. And now we're looking at a situation where they're not getting the results that they have. They're not getting the economics that they believe they deserve the evil folks. And so they're now coming back again. So there's a fellow named Randy Cunningham who was an exiled Igbo leader over in England and in the United States for a while. And he came back to Nigeria and was promptly arrested. So upon his arrest, he spent about two years in jail. And there was a rally point around him to try to get him out or cause some of his trouble. In response, the federal government went down and basically declared martial law military law in a lot of these states arrested and killed protesters who were demanding the release of Tommy. In addition to that, in the north, there's a group of folks who basically said, you know, as of October 1st of this year, it may be by the U.S. to leave these states. And if you don't, we will come and kill you. So, here we have a government at the time didn't do anything about that. So, here we have a situation where the Ebay were trying to get their economic and concerns known. The government came in and crushed them for a time. The North said, we only want the Ebay to leave. And they didn't do anything about that. So there was a tacit agreement. It seemed like at the time, a tacit agreement that the government was supporting the house of folks in the north at the expense of the folks in the southeast. And that tension is still going on now. Well, now that's what they're 
the world and really see what's going to happen until you are the one to pay you through with this. Now, there have been some um, inroads into helping in that situation, but it's really is in some form that has been um, clarified or to form as of today, as a word, as history. And so, I'm trying to look at this. So, that's probably one of the biggest issues right now is the e bikes, especially since women, have to read their again. They tend to be um, over-educated, if you're familiar with a lot of the books that come out of their journey. Many of them are e bikes, and they're intuitive, and right, and the um, other two London is another one, right? I feel like Sam and Kana, and possibly the, the greatest piece of African literature, things called the part, and it was, it was also an e bike person. So, they feel like they have not only the economics and intellectual capacity and the skills and capabilities to run the country, but they feel like they've largely been left out of the country. Whether we agree with that, we don't know, because if you listen to North Side, the North Side says we give them plenty of opportunity to, to join, and they refuse to join because they want to see. So, why is the United Secessionist movement into the country? That's just going to undermine what we want to do up here. So, that's a lot of the country forces up here. Whether or not we buy them is, is a question to a northern or a southeastern. The Yoruba folks in the southwest, they care about the rights. They care about the economics of Lagos is the commercial company of Nigeria. It's like New York City. And London and everything's wrapped in the way. 20, 25 million people live in Nigeria on an infrastructure that's built for two to five. And the power outage is every single day. We had a traffic jam two or three miles long just to go across the bridge just a half mile long. And so we spend a lot of time in playing you know, board games with our friends and wrapping on the corner to, to some compete because we couldn't really go on and have to do for you and whatever it is. So we wish them can fit. So that is the situation of the FMP today for me. Take so a few questions on the things I talked about before I didn't see the photo college in the time. I'm going to mention this word that I would use. Um, we are diplomatically and very truthfully working towards a solution. We have both folks at the table, and I've been visiting out there, and we don't think we're not the one. We have nine teams with the ambassador sometimes. Met with the Evil Beetle, so the grand people of Evil Land, and a certain people in Boston, and I need to work on the story of the Evil Land. This is quite extraordinary. And everything I've told you is essentially what they want. They want better representation. They want um, this idea that they belong at the table and have been refused by the moment. So, our intervention to use our word is to encourage them to sit down and become one Nigerian. That the greater good is better than what you guys are looking for. They have some valid concerns. They really do. Um, but secession is not the answer. And neither is completely ignoring the norm, which is what they were prepared to do. Their idea is that it's not like problem that they're struggling with. Because we're looking at people, hey, um, you know, we've got the house of farming things, so they're kind of struggling with that. We don't have the resources you guys do. We need to share. We're one nation. And they the maybe it's just like, I don't care. That's that is it is such an irrelevancy to them, they don't have that. Mainly because of tribalism that I talked about before. The community issues that they deal with out there. The family unit is the most important unit, and then the community and then your village, and then your and your family. After that it's come up as a part of the It's interesting though, when you come out and do these talks and talk about my gender things, I'm not sure that there's a country in the world that has such a negative reputation as Nigeria. When I tell people I spent two years in Nigeria, I get this blank look, and I get all these sorts of questions. And there are some people based on, you know, who this person is, or who do I feel like talking about this? I'll say I will still look at the bank sometimes. It's just good. Well, they need it sometimes when you can say, well, thank you. And, but that's kind that's of what it feels like sometimes. It was a stressful time to do that. I had much less than I do now. And, you know, I took every single day there was early, I tell you. But at the same time, the world is so important. I encourage you to go out there and read about it and get involved in the situation, get involved in Africa, get involved in Nigeria. One way you can do that is through some online groups that you can work through, there are NGOs you can work through as well, there are donations you can do as well. They do need everything from everyone. 
There's nothing else in there. You know, that, that's the only way to take it. Thank you. It's meant to be yes. It's meant to be. The question is, is the useful system of them the most old system in Nigeria, what is it about? It was modeled after the U.S. Constitution. The Nigerian Constitution was modeled after the U.S. Constitution. This concept of states, this concept of representation, this concept of senators and governors was modeled after the United States. And the problem that comes up is that the folks that are power want to stay power and very frankly get rich being in power. And that's just the bottom line. So the crux of issues that are out there are real. And the laws that have in their books are really good. If you ever read my general law in one time, which I'm unfortunately, they're really good. Some of the challenges that are around my general law is that it's very specific. One of the advantages of American laws in terms of it's not. There's room for interpretation. And some of our laws, and so the judges, and we go, and we have this sort of back and forth. But in my general law, it's not good, it doesn't exist. And that's a different kind of problem. So the administrative system is very similar to the American system in the civil. You have the divorce, you have the law, you have the federal, you have the state. So all of those are very similar. So the question here. Mm -hmm. One of the benefits of living in my right place at Nigeria is that no one really wants to come here. Mm -hmm. So if you live in the river, you really go in the middle of the so he was a career foreign service officer, and he was a three time ambassador. He was in Djibouti before, and then he was in Rwanda, and then he was in Nigeria. So this is his third ambassadorial person. And he's been in service for a very long time. And his father is actually senator from Missouri, and he's a senator of something. But that this might have been embarrassing for himself, was his father. And he comes from a very long history of, of a political family, and he's leveraged up very, very well in his own hands. Is a terrific guy and we really enjoy working with him all the time. That's my point. Yeah, so. The threat is still very real. So, one of the things that, there were a couple of things that happened after the hiring was elected president. The one was he robbed much of the resources, the military resources. They were sending the Bougia and the Nile Sun. The second book of Ram was at the Northeast. I think that's a little bit. And in the United States, that's what's going on. I mentioned before that I'm going to use some of the cities. The difference from white is that there's a white child up there is that you're going to be in the mines and you're going to be in the border of Oregon. So, up in the Gregory is where this stuff is happening. But the Boko Haram was set up in these islands in White Chad, moving as a base, using boats and canoes right across the river, and rampaging the villages from here and go back to the river. And for us, up in, up in that area. Um, but there were no military assets at that time, very few at the time. We're not sure really so well. When Bill Jonathan was in charge, he kept everyone in the Bouza and that side because he felt that's where the resources were. Before, I mean, I mentioned before, the Nile was fairly about the north, and that's part of the problem. That's how Boko Haram came to be, no one cared about the north. And then they even had a crackdown and killed the leader at the time, Yusa. Executed basically what you do extrajudicially, in addition to his family, and then he was replaced by Daniel Chappelle, who now has taken from this um, theory of the police and the military, which is not good. But he's still doing the law, and so now we're going to build these um, in civilians. So that is what has happened historically. The United States has helped get some of this done as well. We've trained some of their folks, we've trained some of their military, we've trained some of their police. And we've encouraged them to know some of these assets as well as being able to assistance too. So, Boko Haram is still a threat. It's not as bad as it was before. It's still pretty bad. It's still not allowed to go up there. Um, but it would probably be a lingering issue for a very long time. We we'll always have these ones to choose. Yes. Yeah. Well, I can't speak to the Bibi in particular, but I can speak to some of the folks from the in general. And what, what happens in Nigeria is that they're, they're looking for more on the time. So we would give them some assets, we sell them some assets, and we increase some assets. 
And so the assets that we give them will sometimes linger and rot on the runways of the airport. So if you fly in, you'll we'll see American planes sitting on the tarmacs outside of the city that have never been flown, never been used, but somehow they can protest. They don't do very good job maintaining it. So it's not just a question of selling them, assets, but also to them to maintain it and use them effectively. So that's the situation we're in now. It's, we're not sure we want to give any more stuff. Because the stuff we gave you is supposed to be not being used all over. So let's think about relearning and returning some of this. So, you know, I have to remind you to use my personal opinion. So, um, I don't believe Chinese in the, in the business of nation building. The government, they're in the business of money, the business of currency. They're in the business that they could talk about that they might, you know, try to cash in sometime down the road. They don't do a lot of money. But they'll say, okay, here's some money for a bridge, here's some money for a highway, here's some money for this or that. Um, why don't you give me some of the rights that come from that, whether it's logging or something else? And then somewhere down the line, you know, we'll talk to you about something you need to do. The United States approach, which is fully agree with this, if you want this bridge, or if you want this entity that we plan to build for you, you need to do some things first. Take care of the human rights issues. Take care of the civil rights issues. Talk about some of the democracy that has to go on. See, maybe put down some of these interactions that are going on first. So the U.S. approach is always something tied to something. And that works for us pretty well. You don't want to get involved. I don't believe you want to get involved in these situations. You're giving things away. It's not for free necessarily, but without something in return. And that's a transactional relationship that we believe in. That is driven in. The Chinese transaction approach is economic return. And I think that's the biggest disparity between the two. It's all we do. And I have a specific example of the way they in the photo clear. You see. So here's the whole idea. This thing in the back. Yes. Yes. We, we, check, we know what's being spent. We know what's being spent on. So historically, I don't think this is unique for the State Department necessarily. But sometimes it's tough to know how the money is being used and, and really what's the effect of that usage, not just today, as well, but five, ten, fifteen years from now. I think that's the biggest challenge is we've given them some assets, we've given them some assistance. What is the long term effect on them? So you build a school, we won't see the result of that school for generations, but yet we know it's a positive thing. So yes, the money is being tracked, and yes, we're trying very hard to be sure that the FPC of that money is also being tracked. And so just make Okay. There's a lot of concern about the bank. And do we even allow to see he's been in the country for about two months or so? He's been in, he recovering in the United Kingdom for most of this time. He was diagnosed with cancer and he's undergoing cancer treatment. His vice president is largely been in charge. Now, I believe this. How this happened 10 years ago, we might see something very different than we do today. Historically, when a leader has left Nigeria, there's been a coup. It's happened. It happened many times over the 80s and 90s. We haven't had that happen. The has been away for 10 or less of months, and yet we still have a creating function program, people we can work with. Now, I shouldn't say that the vice president's in charge. What I'm saying is that he is at least right now in the country where we can find out our requests and our and how we could get stuff through them through the line in the United Kingdom. So, I think he's doing an effective job. I think he's a very big up for them. And he's good with Jonathan. For all his thoughts and for all of his praise, um, there are a lot of things left to respect. But let's be clear about something about Nigeria, too. As a country, it's only been in existence since 1960. 1960 is the first year of independence from Nigeria. Right? I'm going to take a guess and say that 15 is room 
born before 1960. So the people in this room are older than this country. Think about where we were 60 years ago, 50 years ago, back to 1776. We haven't even fought the Civil War yet. We haven't fought the Spanish American War yet. We haven't finished you know, all the other wars that we've tried to get into after that period, too. They needed time to get through this. And I think they really got through this. We're the first peaceful transition of power in its history. That's a phenomenal thing to think about when you think about it. Okay? So when you think about the only been in existence since 1960, they've had a relatively peaceful government in one syllable. We've had a president who is duly elected out of the country, and if his vice president has not been assassinated, that's a plus. Right? So these are all the good things that I think we can look forward to as this country matures, as it grows, as it gets up and out of This one. Oh, yeah, and that, and that is true, and it's really two groups. But yes, that's absolutely true. So, as part of the Constitution, one of the different from ours is that when the president is elected, let's say he comes from the north, the vice president must be from the south. And then the next time around, the president must come from you know, the south, and the vice president comes from the north. That way, these ethnic issues have sort of been mitigated. The problem is many of these. And folks have not once a day in their capacity. So the other one was a duly elected American president. And before the other job, good luck Jonathan was his vice president. He got in office after a year, the Northern one. Good luck Jonathan took over as the president, as per the Constitution, won again, re elected. So he was on a turn to the Northern. The Northern said, wait a second, you should have voted again. We had a guy die in the year in, so obviously we should have a guy go replace him or something like that. So this is the ongoing battle between the North and the South. And now we're in the Bukhari, right? Because we left as a person before, but now he's a person of honor. He's a Northern one. And hopefully we'll see that peaceful transition continue from back and forth. So that's the very nice. Thank you. The bulk of it goes towards HIV, and the top one. They're the biggest recipient of the top one in the world, really. And it's um, helped, I wouldn't say eliminate, but certainly has put HIV under control in the, in the country. And we also get a lot of malaria money, too. We do get some military aid, just like most countries do. They get foreign aid, and they also get money that says, here's some money, do some good with it. And that happens as well. You know, the volume I can't even speak to, but those are mentioned. Very much so, yes. They speak to mostly the South and um, a bit to the North in terms of agricultural issues and health, health issues as well. So, malaria is now one of the biggest next strategies outside of it. So, malaria now is one of the biggest issues. Okay, so I'll go through photo collage. Just make sure there's some more questions for you. Okay. And I will say, um, part of what I hear is if you want to join the Foreign Service, <laughs> Um, I'm happy to take some questions after. There are some documents outside. Um, uh, you need to be 59 on injury and duty. So you have to start like when you're 57, but it is realistically. So um, I'll just put that up in there. Okay. So I haven't put down the folks who might be interested in joining the phone service. So I'll go from there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, so a little bit of photo collage is keeping this with us. And we were so Friday is the day you find out where you're going in the phone service. And after five or six weeks of, of training, you literally get a plan with your country in there. And they do to you by your mentor. And my mentor, our class mentor is Tom Shannon, who's now the Undersecretary of Political Affairs, who's actually the Assistant Secretary of State, and is waiting for your tourist to be um, confirmed. So Tom Shannon was on at your left, and that was Anita, and she wasn't. Not happy about that. The problem is this. Um, um, and as an aside, you know, when I said where I wanted to go, I told them I wanted a language, I wanted something within my code, which is management, or something operational, perhaps. And um, um, of course, I got no language, and that's something completely on the side of And I knew it was new. Our friends went to Milan, and they ended up in the United So I went to live this. And the upper right is me expecting the building. We want to be able to look in the housing compound and one of the big new facilities out there. So um, the, the hat um, is painful in the gym. My, my big 
Mm-hmm. Here, so it looks kind of fun with them. I like the left, uh, bottom left, uh, left, the looking at it is uh, the same time as that, so I like that. So we want to do that pattern with red well and the uh, second and uh, one left. In the, the middle one is uh, a little bit of informal diplomacy. This guy is a chief in Nigeria. Um, this was um, a consulate um, event where Nikki Parker was one of the biggest actors in the universe of life in all of Nigeria. Um, this guy lived in the New York City and said, wow, it was very close to me. And he had a very hearty hamster. And um, I'm just thinking, oh, um, Bill Red is my dad, my, my two dogs. And you can see my little one on the left here. He's a little Pomeranian. And I'm playing Pokemon, Gummy. And so that's what I'm doing. Gummy. Yeah. Oh, it's like a pool. And my backpack stack, like the left, is uh, the British High Commission. So I was the only backpacker in Nigeria. And so I got invited to some of these events. The guy on the right is an admiral in the, in the Navy. And I'm like, sure was a staff assistant. So, and this was for the, um, the Queen's birthday. So, I played for the Queen's birthday. She wasn't there, but the event was the Queen's birthday. So, the right in one is a tugboat that's washed ashore in Tokyo. It's not there anymore, but this is a figure from Silkwall. You can kind of see that out there. I researched Frigga, and what I, what I found was Frigga was a Swedish tugboat vessel that lost the barge in some time. And right after it lost its barge, it was decommissioned and sold in a journey. So there's a metaphor there. <laughs> As I stand in front of it, <laughs> and that is the photo story. That is a true story. And friends of His Excellency, we went to the oil state to get away and get in toy of moderation. That was my chair, friends of His Excellency. And my sister, who's a very nice friend, I went to. And this is, and this is a place called. And Makoko is a floating city. There's a BBC documentary on, on, on Makoko. You can see it on YouTube. It's on a long way of reading. We used the folks to live and breathe and work on the water. They, many of them never touch land. There's schools on land. There's big colonies on land. Most of it's fishing and logging. On the top left is a guy throwing his fishing nets and rides some kids playing. And the bottom left is a kid back with some gravel. And the right one is spread out loud, and that's from a different part of the country, but these are kids playing in the house where they stood. Upper left is um, the Arab ambassador speaking with an ex governor's wife, um, Madame Duke, as well as some folks from the Nigerian conservation elite. So, one of my jobs out there was to put a little on the second mention health report, so we see it. And I picked up the wildlife trafficking and environmental portfolio, and this was part of it. So what we're trying to do is we are trying to raise awareness of the wonders and beauty of Nigerian natural resources, which are being completely abused. And then the governor of the state, by the the state, had proposed a highway to run across the middle of it, across and through the national forest. And he was dedicating 25% of his entire state to this superhighway. It's not the size of New Jersey, the state, so it's a very, very large superhighway. And by the way, he would sell three billion dollars of logging rights to the Chinese company that would build a road. So we went in there. I didn't say don't do it, because that's not a road. What we did instead was go through a five-day tour, starting from the tip to the bottom, and raising awareness along the way with the ambassador in town, the consulate too, raising awareness about some of the issues that this could raise, including deforestation, including some of the animals that are out there. And this is a needle passing one of the bridges with uh, Madame Duke um, behind her. Um, and this is a very scary bridge, um, I thought, so I was happy to be crossing. And the bottom one is um, the Tony Village. This is sort of in the middle of Prince River. The entire village came out to greet us. And we had VIP seats. There's a council gentleman down here on the left. There's bodyguard and the glasses in the middle. And then all the folks who came out to, to visit us. It was extraordinary. And then, uh, these people live literally in the middle of forest, traditional rulers, um, and they came out for this huge event. Um, unfortunately, it couldn't stay very long. It took a very long time to get there. But um, it was, this is the kind of um, emotions that we see sometimes when we do these kinds of tours. The American presence is welcomed in Egypt. It is something that is important and it's something that um, Nigerians really value. So, of all the nations that are there, I dare say, they like the Americans best. They really do the really, need. Really, 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 really do the feel and truly love the Nigerian arts. It's extraordinary. Um, Columbus Lodge is a hotel that I could have um, stayed at, and that's the information office on the left. Um, the Columbus Lodge. <laughs> I didn't stay there, just a little bit. 
in the right room on my right is, is a drill monkey. So you went and visited the drill monkey ranch. It's uh, stated in the middle of the cluster of the state. The drill ranch is, a, is an organization that was founded by two Americans who arrived in Nigeria about 30 years ago and stayed. And they decided to make conservation in Nigeria. They wanted to live in their lives. So they raised money through various means um, to save the drill monkey, among other things. That's the one I want to love. The two, the, the two white, the two white folks, and three birds, as we would say in Nigeria, and with her ambassador on the right, and then a head chief of the, of the state in, in the middle. And then the back is off the map, and the drill monkeys live when they're released. And then some of the rounds I was talking about, really difficult to get to. This is a five-ton vehicle and crossing a wooden platform across the stream. We made it, and there, so we made it. And to the right are some bananas that they use for, for the two monkeys. A couple left is a kid who lived on the ranch and sort of hooked up to. He was um, he basically fed the animal bananas and food water. Um, the right, up the right, is some of the deforestation that happens with the side of planting. So this is an illegal farm that was built in the middle of the national forest. It's like if you wound up in a national forest, decide to clear cut three acres and plant some potatoes, that's, that's what's happening there. But there's very little in the way of any administrative um, rules and regulations and enforcement, and this is part of the problem that's on the ground. This will likely turn into an entire desert within a uh, dozen years or so, and nothing's going to grow there, which is part of the function. And more pictures with the drill monkeys, and then this is the restroom um, along the way. This is what counts as a rest stop. Um, <laughs> yeah. The upper left is a young Hawaiian herdsman. So this is a very small um, crop photo as he was involved in the farm. And his food was easily a thousand cattle. I would say easily a thousand cattle. And this is a cluster of estates, so quite a bit away from home. And what he was doing with his, with his friends and family was bringing his cattle down to the farmlands in the south and then basically eating all the crops of the farmers that are down there. This is one of the biggest issues that are happening in the farm herds and then the folks in the southeast. Why isn't anyone doing anything about this? So, so it's the evil man who has a farm. Meanwhile, these folks um, say, well, I don't have any food up there, so I need to bring my cattle down. And this has caused, um, as it's say, a genocide, because it's not, and that this has caused thousands of deaths in northern and middle of Nigeria. This exact kind of thing, where they walk across with their cattle, someone shoots first, and now we have a situation, especially a generation. Up around is a museum um, with the pink bear, and this is one of our guns. And we travel everywhere with guns, and we have guns with guns, and we have guns with guns. And again, the left is in one of the high chiefs from that larger boat that I talked about before, this one down here. So it's a cross of the table, it's sort of in the middle. And on the right, on the bottom, is the Obama Lagos, who's the king of Lagos, with his stuffed lungs. And so he, he cannot hold the microphone himself, because his assistant is for him, and it's his very unusual, but very interesting kind of thing. He's giving him quite, quite a speech. This is in the market. So this is a woman uh, balancing, and it turns out to be peanuts on her head. She's waiting for him to come out of the bottom of the market. And on the right is one of many thousands of fiber trucks that have been bought at the market where you can go and shop and turn it into um, into dresses and, and other materials. So I'm actually just wearing something today that she got from um, these markets. And here's the photos in the head. And there's some work to do too sometimes, although it doesn't look like an artist in the outside. And the upper left is me on TV. And as this is a screenshot from a television and news article, this is the seven of them, seven times on television, seven times on radio. And they basically went on the Nigerian Good Morning America show to take them in visas. So the audience has been 40 million people, okay. mm -hmm. which is mind boggling a little bit when you think about it. And then on the right is me representing the future African world in the Senate, so I want you know, to represent and the police and all of those things. So, clean up. And by the left is um, Dr. Drill Ranch. This is something that I always had up in Nigerian and American flags. And, and the middle one there is part of our um, cluster, the tour, the basket, and speaks to some, some children. And shortly after this, they're just a friend's doing I think it was. They asked for some kids to give a speech. So the kid went up and gave a speech, and he started rapping for about um, eight or nine minutes. It was, um, I'm not sure who's saying it, but he eventually got the hook. And, and 
and they stop them from talking. So that's that's the quick photo collage of the Montana manager. And that's in my final presentation. I want to ask more questions. Yes, sir. It's an Italian company in the Nigeria company. Thanks. It is. The Morano is a difficult um, thing to measure, especially when you live on the streets, because by and large, I'm the better for worse, and I think we can speak for 20 years now. And we are sometimes disconnected a bit from the home office, and we are not able to do the work that we need to do and without a lot of the noise of the field. And actually from Washington, which in the way in some ways it's determined. I also have had a benefit on a fairly low level. I'm from the first year of council officer, so uh, my job is, is to do the good business. I don't deal with the problems, we don't deal with the programs as much. And I went out and talked to folks and we wrote things about it, but my job is to design and manage them. I think when you're feeling the most of the thing that I'm on are those fairly senior folks who've been in 15, 20, 20 years in DC. And we still have a lot of gaps in the secretaryships. They are coming to be filled, and we're just taking some time. And so it'll work at some point. I sort of tell people we're sort of in a pendulum now, and we're sort of pendulum swinging the other way, and Holly and Helen Clinton, in terms of ramping folks up and hiring folks and getting special envoys. And now we're sort of back the other way of looking at does this really make sense? And so, in the past, I'm all the time in business consulting, I think the exercise makes sense. And we'll see where it comes after this. This will move on to me. <laughs> it's, it's a new response, um, yeah, yeah. So I was sitting in my office in um, my cube in my dearest bank, and um, I got an email from Anita and said, Hey, can you prep this out for me? And I said, Oh, what is this? And so it was a guy who had a farm service test. And um, now I, I, like, I like tests, I just like to take them. So, uh, so it's okay, this looks interesting. I'll run a bunch of this and hang on. So that's, that's kind of how it went. But there really isn't, it's a long process. So, you know, I'm still circling a couple of years now. But basically, you, you take the exam, and then if you pass this, then you send some some short essays and what I call the resume review. And then if you pass that, then you go to DC, then you do all the interview, basically. They put you in a room with five or six people, you work on a project. And then you have a case on what the final year is going to be in 10 minutes. And then you have a traditional interview with two senior foreign service officers generally who are asking questions about about different things. And you pass all that. And then if you do well enough on that, and you can pass and never, never get a job offer. But and if you do well enough on that, then you get pulled off the registry. I'm sorry, before that even happens, then you go through medical and you go through security clearance. So foreign service officers have top secret security clearance. And, and you know, I guess it's a good thing. And, and then from there, you get your medical and spread away. My top secret security clearance took 416 days, which is about a year which is about a year longer or so, maybe a year less longer than most. And I wasn't born in the United States, my mother's a naturalized citizen, and there's a lot of travel. And they said I just had to be sure that I wasn't going to give any of these top secrets for me. And then they obviously kind of found me in the back. So once that happens, I need to get on the registry and go. Okay. That's a good question. We've, we've talked about um, going back in about 20 years to see what it's like, see how things are different. Back in my life, it's going to get better and better every time. It really is. They need to read themselves off of the oil economy, which is a working program. They need to um, open up the protectionism issues that they have right So they're not allowed to import chicken, for example, other things like that. Everything must be inside. They buy the cars for coming in as well because they're going to build up the car industry. But meanwhile, they don't have infrastructure or the manpower or the knowledge to actually develop these industries in homes. And so there's this, this idea that, well, if we force ourselves to make it, then we will rise up and we will make it. Um, but at a certain point, you can't wait anymore. So I think once they start looking at some of those issues and moving some of those issues, then they'll be much better off in the long term. I have very high hopes for them. I wish them well. I'm, I'm, I'm cautious at the least of them. 
By 2050, they expect to be the third most populous country in the world. After China, after India. Some are about 400, 500 million people. So we're not past the United States. They are well past the expansion growth. And there's a youth model that's out there, which has no, virtually no job prospects whatsoever. We have an infrastructure and government that is not interested in long term planning. So I have, I have been cautiously optimistic, but I'm also watching these very carefully. This is the first time I've been. There's one book available, you can buy it. It's a brand book, but I'm going to do the way you're going to do it. Mm-hmm. As part of the mission, a foreign ministry is called uh, Not a Lot of Travel, and we do put my travel on a lot of the same um, zones. So if you show up as a private citizen, you can do whatever you want. I don't think you should, but you know, you can get it. Um, however, there are some amazing parts in the game. They're really true. Cross River State, where we spent about a week, um, has some of the most gorgeous, interesting weather. And it's home to you for you know, the cost of the ground, for the most. Um, you know, kind of use of the most endangered girl in the world. The dreadlock is too, very much endangered, the pendulum, which is sort of my, um, my friend and foe down there, the pendulum. And they are for the biggest girls for enhancements, and so in China. And that's, that's where they go. So these are all the issues that I'm here to. You know, you know. Most of the tourism, if you can follow that, is just the first thing about the visit of the United States. And it's very mm-hmm. yeah, risky. They're yeah, also the hot most time targeted for ransoms and kidnappings. So um, you can work for tourism. There's something we call the Lego store, the lecture tour. So you can go to the market, you can go to the Lego store, but you can work for them. She's an office worker. Mm-hmm. It's um, Amanda. Mm-hmm. She's off the video next to you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really good question because they, they're aware that there have been changes. They're not exactly sure why, and the fact that they don't care as much. And they know where the food is and where they're going to take their road, so that's where they're going. So they're going drifting, they're drifting further for themselves as the area landscape drifts further for themselves. The Sahara is also expanding, the Visa is extremely expanding. It's a serious issue. When you bump that up against the deforestation issues and the palm oil industry that really wants to force that land doing that too, you're in for a very, very serious situation. So I don't, that's going to be one of the sticky points, I think, for the moment to the future. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I'd be very cautious with you. Um, you named a couple areas that are um, very high on the list of issues. Issues that are just give me, I'm not saying don't go. Just take your precautions. Um, be sure you're with the security factor that you trust, and be sure you're trying to get it. And don't um, keep a little profile. And don't carry a lot of money with you. Don't carry a lot of flash jewelry with you. Stay within the law. And we drove around in diplomatic vehicles and diplomatic plates and fully on the vehicles from the time. And we still have attention from the authorities. And oftentimes, unfortunately, the authorities are the ones who are the most trouble. And they're the ones who set the roadblocks. They're the ones who are getting money from you. And we can just wave them off and point to your license plates or whatever it might be. You won't have that ability to do that. So I would just be very, very cautious. People do do it. People have come down and have wonderful experiences. And just be very careful with it. Register the State Department before you go. Tell the you're going to come. And register this, this awarding system that's called out there. So awardings are um, American citizens generally who are responsible for certain areas of the country. So these awardings are the ones who register with the museums. They might be one of the ones. Um, you will miss the next one you have to go. If you and I, I would write them and ask for maybe six to eight years and you can give those to you if they do. That's fine. Mm-hmm. 
more, I get this impression from my wife all the time. Um, I, I, I am just in hell on that list. Because I, well, I do have reason. I actually do have reason. Because the younger generation of us spoken with are so far engaged in the positive aspects of what they want to do in their country and their education and the terms of their life and what they want to see in terms of change. They're the ones who eventually go and tip the scales to be in a positive country. The young folks are really worried about this whole thing. And when I mean young, I mean 18, 19, 25 years old. I mean 40, 35 years old. That's right. They don't get it. It's true. I mean, they just don't want to be going to have a enough against the wall. You can give up and you can find somebody in the line, right? But we've seen some folks who, in spite of all the issues, in spite of all the negative issues that they experience in their lives, still make change and affect change. So we have, uh, as you call it, men, we have the climate change issues going on in the UN. These are men that the folks who are um, creating these job opportunities out there too, and they're, they're training their people, and for the younger people, so that's why I'm here. Not all of them are going to be successful, but I'm going to hopefully see them one. The second one is a new one, Paul. Most of the old ones, the new old ones are awesome. Mm-hmm. It is. Because in order to, just like the United States in many ways, you've got Republicans and you've got Democrats. In Nigeria, you've got the PDP, and you've got the large changes that you see in America these days. And they, every time they lose, you change your mind. It's fun. And it's true. And so they need to nominate somebody to run, and so they may not nominate anybody. They really have been disenfranchised in the political system. And so they run on their own, and they are governors of the United States, but in terms of national environment, national governments, they're essentially that thing. Time for one or two questions. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. They're, they're building it out very quickly, but the issue is the infrastructure that's required to make it happen in a meaningful way. The roads are often, there's very little, very little refrigeration. There's very little um, farm to market opportunities. So getting the stuff out in terms of agriculture is really hard. And the most most richest man in Africa has some potato um, plant, for example. And this whole tomato plant, many tens of thousands of tons of tomatoes. He can't get enough tomatoes um, in Nigeria. And tomatoes, by the way, are banned from coming into Nigeria, so um, he can't export as much as he wants to. There are and have been grain exports that have been getting better and better. We sat down and visited with the governor of the state who was very keen on telling us about his new airport, was now shipping out his cargo of wheat to the United Kingdom, and was cleared through customs and all that. So he's very proud of that. Um, and they do these for regional things, and that's very difficult to get the stuff out. We do, um, we do. So the US possible and the only, depending upon where it is, the embassy of the council is at the leading We have an economic officer who deals with many of exports. We have a foreign commercial officer who's not quite state, but he works on bonds for C's on commission. And we have to be a really good guy, and he works with them as well. And we also have a lot of U.S. and U.S. folks and financial trade reps up in Abuja. One of the but one of the things you get to do at the better time as as an actual officer is something called control duty. So you uh, you work with um, the other people who come to town. So I worked with the, the Secretary Pritzker when she came to town and talked about some um, economic things that we could try to do about the general in 2016. And the Secretary of the Town, it's been. The Palmer's tree is one of the leading export or intended exports in Nigeria. It is the idea that palm is going to save Nigeria from one. So part of that exercise in parts of the state where they were going to build this big super highway tree, they were going to clear three miles on either side to deforest it, sell the log and rights train it, and then build a palm on the track all along this tree by the issue with that is, palm oil is good, it doesn't really do well, first of all. 
And it also lasts about 10 or 15 years. And once it's done, it's extracted all of the nutrients out of the land. And after 10 or 15 years, that land literally is desert. There's nothing left on the land. You cannot find anything else on the land without a lot of work. So it's another example of short term gains that are traded on for the future of Nigeria. There is a place for palm oil when it's done land. I'm not saying don't do palm oil. But there are chunks of land that are better suited for it than others. And if their, if their idea is to transition from the liquid natural resource of oil to the liquid natural resource of palm oil, that's a risk for the oil into the near future. That's something that's not going to be sustainable. So as you drive up and down in the Cross River State, we saw many examples of forests being cleared for palm oil. Huge chunks of land, like the thousands of acres of industrial farm land. Many of them are Chinese companies, I think that's true. So, what many of them are Chinese companies that are doing this, again, for the short term gain, and that the long term will really have to explain. This one, this one. Yeah, it's a really good question. The question is, uh, what does Nigeria in the context of East Africa and maybe within the context of Africa itself? And Nigeria not the long ago, Nigeria not the long ago was considered one of the strongest and most assertive countries in all of Africa. And they were the ones that helped put down the places and started young and rebellion during those um, civil wars that were in the middle of the genocide. So they were leading these efforts in, in the 90s during the time. Somewhere along the way, they kind of became a little more nationalistic than they became more the true. But they do have decent relationships with Cameroon, and with China, and with Israel, and with Benin. And I would say that Cameroon is, they have a large relationship with them, and China is quite close to the Rock, Boko Haram, and the Lake Chad region. So there's a lot of that. Economically, they still have the same issues. Again, getting things across the border in the are very difficult. There was a Great um, with the auto industry where they're not allowing any cars coming from Benin anymore. They've been known as well a bit earlier. But that was because they didn't believe that Benin was doing its part in ensuring that these cars are coming from the hotels and so they're across the border. So they said, okay, we want cars from Benin. So it's not necessarily a trade war, um, but they have become much more protectionist, much more isolation for the last decade or so. And we think that has triggered some economic issues that will further bring to the market. Thank you.